So what makes a fad a fad and why do major changes in our society happen so dramatically and suddenly? Those questions are at the heart of a new book called The Tipping Point, How Little Things Make a Big Difference. It is the first book from Malcolm Gladwell of the New Yorker magazine, and I am pleased to have him back to talk about this book. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to see you. Yes. Uh, where did this idea come to you? Well, I, I was writing about uh, a couple years ago, I was covering um, the AIDS epidemic. Right. And I got very interested in the kind of internal dynamics of epidemics right. because they have a, their own sort of weird logic. And um, it just began to occur to me that I didn't understand why when we talk about contagious things, we confine our conversation to viruses or to, to diseases. Mm -hmm. Because the clearly, phenomenon of disease could be attributed to other places, yeah, other well, ideas. But also, also, yes, exactly, that those same principles, I mean, so many different things are other things, ideas, trends, song lyrics, um, are contagious in precisely the same way. I mean, I talk in the book about the word yawn. If I say the word yawn long enough, you will start yawning. yawning and exactly. people watching a show will start yawning. That's an incredibly contagious word. Um, and it's contagious in precisely the same way as... Contagious as meaning everybody catches it? or Everyone's contagious catching it. And right. it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. spreading from one source um, everywhere. But there's the same thing is true for, I think, for particular for products or ideas or um, behaviors, especially. I talk in, in the book about all kinds of contagious behaviors. All right, what about people? I mean, you got this, some, some understanding of this mm -hmm. in some serious way from people mm -hmm. like Grodzin and others who... From epidemiologists who yeah. have, over the last, you know hundred years have spent an extraordinary amount of time um, describing and um, uh, understanding the, the sort of subtle dynamics of, you know, when I give an example in the book of, of a syphilis epidemic in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore in the space of really a year goes from a town with a negligible syphilis problem to being having one of the worst syphilis problems in, North, in the world, actually. And, you know, that phenomenon has been really beautifully described and studied. Um, by a number of epidemiologists, and it's a it's a really powerful uh, model, I think, for thinking about. It's one of several in the book, but for thinking about um, the spread of anything in a contained population. Okay, so what's the what's the tipping point in that? Well, the tipping point is the word that comes from uh, from um, study of epidemics is to, to describe that moment in the epidemic when uh, it explodes, when the moment of critical mass. Um, and if you look at every epidemic, there is always that moment when the curve suddenly shoots up very sharply and dramatically. And so understanding how you can get to the tipping point is really this, um, is the critical question when you're looking at something that's contagious. How can I bring this... I think the critical question is what is the tipping point, but you don't think so. Yes, well, that's also, no, no you're absolutely right. That's also critical because it differs from, from epidemic so to epidemic. You know, um, I mean, if you look at New York City crime, for example, two clear tipping points, uh, late 60s, 67, 68, when crime explodes in the space of two years, it goes from, we go from a city with a very, uh, New York has a very minor crime problem until the late 60s. And then uh, mid 90s, when crime suddenly tips down and in the space of two years, when murder drops by two thirds. Okay, so what are the tipping point in both of those? Um, the tipping point, well, I talk a lot in my book about uh, the latter case. Um, I, I mean, I imagine, uh, I think that the, the 60s one is a harder example. In the latter case, I do think it was some combination of of innovative police strategies, broken windows theory, um, uh, greater community involvement, that kind of thing. It was a bunch of little things that had a, a really dramatic impact in this. Take some fads and show me mm -hmm. where the tipping point is, or will be, or likely to be. Um, well, uh, the, the word of mouth epidemics are something that um, I spend a lot of time on in the book. I mean, and the, the great sort of historical example that has a, um, where the tipping point is really obvious is uh, is Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Most famous word of mouth epidemic of all time. <laughs> yes. um, the, the contagious message is the British are coming. Right. Um, the tipping point in that case is Paul Revere himself. And he's an example of what I call a tipping person. Um, because somebody else leaves Boston that night, William Dawes, um, with the same message. But no one, in all the towns William Dawes rode through, no one listened to him. And no one from those towns gathers the next morning to fight the British. But everybody that, um, that Paul Revere rides through you know, their, their militias gather. What's the difference? The difference is that Paul Revere is this extraordinary individual. He's this unbelievably exceptional guy who, he's what I call in the book a connector. Um, he had the biggest Rolodex in colonial New England. He was on every member of every club and every society. Everybody knew him. He was incredibly gregarious. So when he goes to these towns, um, it's not simply him shouting out, the British are coming. It's him. It's people seeing 
it, yeah. that it's him. He has credibility. Yeah, right. He also knew who to tell because he knows everybody. He knows that if I'm riding through Waltham or whatever or Needham, um, you know, Joe Smith is the guy who can get this all right. the way to, to the, you know. Um, so, if, so one if, individual. If Joe Smith, he knows if Joe Smith hears, it'll be spread. Yes, like even further. And, too. Yeah. Whereas William Dawes, you know, who knew William Dawes? I mean, so he rides through at 2 a.m. Yeah. shouting the British are coming. Who is this? So that's an example of how an individual can have, can serve as a kind of human tipping point. Take something like Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Sesame Street is a really fascinating example of a learning epidemic. Right. Um, and I devote a chapter to trying to figure out why this show was so incredibly successful. And uh, the answer is that they pay, that show, first of all, our conception of that show is all wrong. We think of it as, as Jim Henson and a bunch of really clever guys sitting around coming up with, you know, pulling ideas out of their hat. In fact, it's a show that's created by a team of cognitive psychologists, the leading cognitive psychologists of the day, sat down and engineered segment by segment how that show you know how that show should how to how to how to how to um uh, structure information so that it fits into the head of three-year-olds in other words how does a three-year-old think and how can i put letters on the screen or structure the narrative or the dialogue here so that it fits right into their head and makes and has what i call stickiness which i think is a very critical component in creating an epidemic what's stickiness stickiness would be um for an idea to be epidemic it must be more than contagious must be more than, the, it must have more than the ability to spread from you to me. It, you also have to remember it, right? It has to make an impact on you. It has to, so if I want to start an epidemic of learning in kids, it's not enough to hold a child's attention for 50 minutes in a television show. I have to, um, that information has to stay with them. So, that, so it, 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 you know, it creates a learning process that affects when they go to school two years down the road. Or, and that was what they were looking for. And they did all of this extraordinary, at the time, um, really quite revolutionary stuff in trying to measure, like they would strap kids in chairs and put these special um, goggles on them. And, uh, you know, you'd have Grover on the screen saying C-A-T, and the letter C-A-T, saying cat, and the letter C-A-T would appear on the screen. And so they would have this, these goggles which allowed them to track the, where the eyeballs of the yeah. kids are moving. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> and if the kids were looking at Grover and not the letters, then yeah. they would scrap it and start over again. Or if the kids were looking at the letters but they were going... Um, uh, they were going right to left and not left to right, they would scrap it and start over again. So it was that kind of extraordinary attention to detail that made that show, that was the tipping point for that show, that made it more than simply a fun... Now, doesn't every television show, I mean, except this one, do that now? Don't they all go out there and try to figure that out, where the eyeballs are going up and down? And For example, I, mm -hmm. I think that the, some of the magazine shows used to do this thing where they, I mean, they would measure what happened every 15 seconds so they mm -hmm. could tell when the viewers lost interest, when they gained interest, this, what made the story compelling, not compelling, what made it stick, not stick. Yeah. Oh, this is all... It, this, they're absolutely doing it now, but it, it starts with Sesame Street. No. Sesame Street started all of this, um, this kind so of... So does Sesame Street stickiness make it yeah. a fad or a trend? Uh, it makes it a well. It makes it an epidemic. It makes okay. it a trend. I mean, a fad is just a a, a, a very a temporary, non-sticky trend. Um, but Sesame Street starts, I think, this kind of in, incredibly long-running um, learning. I mean, it permanently elevates the, you know, the intellectual caliber of three-year-old life in this country. Is this just a fun book for you to do, or is this something that I mean, is this just like, you know, Malcolm who writes these very interesting pieces and seems to do what the hell he wants to do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the New Yorker, yeah. I mean, you don't dictate the subjects; you choose them, right? Yeah, no, no. I, I do what I do. Actually, do whatever I want. Yeah, That's exactly. A good, good and so all of a sudden, you decided that the t you know yeah. something's going on. I'll try to figure this out. And so yeah. you went in search to explain a phenomenon that you were observant of. Well, I got you know, it's there are all kinds of things that happen. Which, um, for example, word of mouth. People use that phrase without ever saying what they mean. I right. hear it all the time. <laughs> Someone's always great word of mouth. And I had never read an explanation, uh, an actual attempt to pin down what that phenomenon is. If, if there is such a thing as word of mouth, who starts it? Who right. sustains it? Who creates it? So I decided Does I somebody start it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think I have, I mean, the book, the whole first part of the book is an attempt to say, all right, this personality is responsible for starting word of mouth. This personality, and I have profiles of each of these kinds of people, is responsible for spreading it. This is the kind of person, yeah. because it comes directly from, it's an idea borrowed directly from um, disease, from, from diseases. If you look at disease epidemics, they are started and spread by a tiny, tiny group of exceptional people. That same idea, I think, is a really powerful way of understanding this previously amorphous concept of word of mouth. Now, does this mean we're all so powerfully subject to suggestion? It means that we're, not only that, but we are powerfully subject to the actions and to activities. To manipulation is a better well, word. No, but it's more than, it's, it's manipulation of a certain sort. 
What I'm, what I'm very interested in is um, the power that certain people within our social circles have over us. Um, so not kind of formal manipulation, not media manipulation, but there are within, if you make a list of all your friends, there are certain friends of yours who play, in all of, I think this is true for all of us, who play extraordinary roles in directing our tastes, in interesting in cer us in certain things, in convincing us of certain things. Yeah. And like I do this, I mean, there's, there's all these kinds well, of tests. five of those people. For me? Yeah. Well, I, I talk about this in the book, actually. Um, Why? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have, for example, I made a list of all my friends, and I tried to figure out how I met those people. So I made a little kind of friend family tree. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that something like 85% of my friends are all the result of a single friendship I have with Jacob Weisberg. Um, including so, his mother. Including his mother. <laughs> including his mother. <laughs> and then I did something like, I did the same thing with like, why do I go to the restaurants I go to? Yeah. It turns out I almost overwhelmingly go to the restaurants I go to because of the suggestions of my friend Ariel. So we have Ariel who controls a huge <laughs> segment of my social life. Well, maybe Ariel has a track record in suggesting good restaurants. That probably contributes to it. Well, it does. But all of Ariel's friends are relying on Ariel's, Ariel for restaurant, restaurant advice. So I actually think you can construct a kind of explanation for why restaurants get hot in Manhattan entirely based on the Because of like Ariel? Ariel. Well, no, not just Ariel alone. <laughs> But like, there are probably how many restaurants are going to be calling for Ariel's number? <laughs> there are three. There may be three, there may be two or three dozen Ariels in Lower Manhattan yeah. who I think have extraordinary power <laughs> over what restaurants get hot or not. I think you are nuts. <laughs> <I've>... <laughs> no, do you think so, really? Oh, it's, it's all. It's, it's That's just, how. It's about three or four Ariels that decide whether some a couple dozen, <laughs> couple of guys who've invested couple... millions of dollars in a restaurant. No, and because... they didn't know that Ariel was out there, so they. This failed. is the structure of social. Okay. This is when you understand what word of mouth and understand what social okay. epidemics are. They rest on the act, and it's completely counterintuitive. But they rest on the actions of a. Take tiny, something tiny like group of people. one of my favorite restaurants, Pastis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all of a sudden it's very trendy, very popular, very whatever. Yeah, you know. Yeah, right. Well, Pastis. Now, this is an account for the for for all social phenomena. Pastis, I don't think, is an epidemic phenomenon because it's a guy with a lot of had incredible track record, a lot of media coverage. A lot of friends. That was very, very conventional. Oh, well, but there are other cases of restaurants that for no apparent reason get incredibly, I mean, some percentage, say 50% of like the hot restaurants in the city yeah. are hot for no apparent reason. And that's when you have to start thinking about the sort of principles yeah. of right, this little old book here is number 17 on the New York Times bestsellers, yeah, right? 13. 13. Yeah. Moving up. Next week is 13. Next yeah. week. Oh, so why, yeah. how would I know that? Yeah. No, you, yeah. I can, that's why I'm telling you. <laughs> Do, is there a tipping point in which it might? Well, I, th I think it, if it's on the list, it's tipped. Oh, it's yeah. tipped. Okay, yeah, so just yeah. being on the list means it's tipped. Yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> it's certainly selling well enough to say that it's tipped. <laughs> All right, the tipping point, how little things can make a big difference. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.